We're going to carry on our series in Philippians. Daryl will come and share in a moment, and I'll read this morning's teaching text. We're in Philippians chapter 1. We're teaching from verses 3 to 11, but I'll read from verses 1 through 11 to give context. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all. Since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the promise that the opening of your word brings light. And we trust you to do that as we work through the passage that we have just read. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Last Sunday, Jason helped us launch this new series in the New Testament document called Philippians. The document is a letter, and if you've read it, you've discovered that it is a very affectionate letter, which the apostle of Jesus named Paul, somewhere between 60 and 62 AD, wrote to the Philippians while in prison in the city of Rome. Philippi is located in what was then known as Macedonia and is now known as Greece. Philippians is a letter written to the first congregation planted on European soil. Now, we're calling this series in Philippians Citizens. Why? Why citizens? Why not call the series something more in line with what immediately stands out to us on first reading of the letter, namely, joy? Paul uses the word joy or rejoice 16 times in his letter. As someone has said, joy ripples and leaps through the book like a stream. So why not call the series something like 16 clues to a joy-filled life? Or why not, since Paul is writing from prison in Rome, something like joy from a prison cell? Why call it citizens? Because of Paul's first exhortation in his letter, one of the best ways to get inside the mind of a writer, especially the writer of a letter, is to pay attention to his or her exhortations to his or her imperatives, to his or her commands. This is not to minimize an author's declarations or affirmations, not at all. In seeking to motivate their readers, most writers ground any exhortation in a declaration. They ground any imperative in an indicative. The exhortation makes sense in light of the declaration. The imperative makes sense in light of the indicative. The fact is, the imperative can only be lived in light of the indicative. Or to put it more simply, good advice can only be lived in the light of good news. Good advice, do this, without the good news, the facts are does not finally motivate. Without good news, good advice is experienced either as oppressive legalism or hopeless idealism. But 
We get at a writer's motive by paying attention to their exhortations. Paul's first exhortation, his first command in the letter he wrote to the Philippians, takes us into the drumbeat of the whole letter and into why we are calling the teaching series Citizens. The first imperative comes in Philippians 1.27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. 1.27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Gospel. The word Paul uses is euangelion, which comes into the English language as evangel, resulting in words like evangelize or evangelical. Evangel means good news. The word is used in the New Testament 76 times. But of course, the New Testament is all about the gospel of Christ. God's good news of what he has done, is doing, and will do in Christ. Now, get this. Of the 76 times in the New Testament, 60 times are in the writings of Paul. Paul uses this word more than any other biblical author. Paul is a man captured by the gospel. Paul is a man under the spell of the gospel. Paul lives and preaches the gospel. His life is participation in the gospel as he characterizes himself and the Philippians in the text we read this morning. Paul lives and dies for the gospel, and his first major exhortation in the letter from Rome is, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Gospel of Christ. Paul is making sure that we know which gospel he's talking about. For you see, Nero Caesar, before whom Paul is waiting trial in Rome, has a gospel. Nero has a good news, as did all the Caesars who came before him and the Caesars who came after him. All the Caesars have their euangelion, their evangel, their good news that in their ascension to the throne, a new era has begun for the empire indeed for the world. Their good news then shapes life in the empire. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Jesus Christ has his euangelion, his evangel. As Savior and Lord, as Soter and Kurios, Jesus also has good news for the empire, for the world. Indeed, he he himself is the good news. So, of course, Paul would exhort us, only conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel of Christ. And now we come to why we're entitling this series, Citizens. The word rendered, conduct yourselves, is poli tuomai. Do you hear the word poli in it? It comes into the English language in words like politics or political. Poli means city or empire. Only conduct yourselves. It means live as citizens of the polis. Live as faithful citizens of the empire. The majority of people living in the city of Philippi were conducting themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Caesar. They were conducting themselves as citizens of an empire shaped by the gospel of Caesar. Paul exhorts the disciples of Jesus living in this city shaped by the gospel of Caesar to now live as citizens of a new city shaped by the gospel of Christ. Later in the letter, Paul reminds the Philippians and us that our citizenship is in heaven. 320. Our citizenship is in heaven. The word citizenship is the word polituma. <clears throat> polituma. Again, hear that little word, poli? In relationship with Jesus Christ, in relationship with the world's true Savior and Lord, our primary residence, our true residence, is in the heavenly polis. As citizens of Rome, Paul and his friends are also citizens of heaven. 
If you will, they carry two passports, a Roman and a heavenly. They're dual citizens. The latter upstages the former. The passport of the heavenly city upstages the passport of the earthly city. Living under the rule of Rome, they've also come under the rule of heaven. Living under the gospel of Caesar, they have also come to live under the gospel of Christ. Living in the empire called Rome, they are also and primarily living in the empire gospel. Are you, are you following me? I can repeat the whole thing if we need to. <laughs> Hence the title for the series, Citizens. So, in each of the Sundays of this fall, as we read different portions of Paul's letter, we'll be asking, how does this help us live as citizens of the empire called gospel? In the beginning section of his letter, in Philippians 1, 1 to 11, Paul is declaring with thanksgiving and joy a fundamental guarantee a fundamental guarantee made to the citizens of the kingdom of Christ. Paul tells the Philippians that he has been praying for them. And then in reporting what he's been praying, he begins with this fundamental guarantee made to the citizens of the heavenly empire breaking into the world in Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6, 1.6. Being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. It's stamped on the first page of our new passport. Life in this new empire shaped by the gospel is grounded in a great confidence. Being confident... I'm citing Paul's words literally, being confident. Most versions of the Bible have a new sentence at verse 6, for I am confident of this. But Paul is not beginning a new sentence. He's continuing the sentence beginning at verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy, my prayer for you. Why joy? Why always thanking God with joy? Well, for one thing, they and we are participating in the gospel. Verse 5, in view of your participation in the gospel from this first day until now. So he prays with joy. But more importantly, being confident of this very thing. I thank my God being confident of this very thing. Paul prays for his friends in Christ with thanksgiving and joy because God has begun a work in them and God is going to bring this work to completion at the day of Christ. Now, we ought to burn this guarantee of our heavenly citizenship into our souls, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. This is what causes Paul to pray and speak with joy, which causes joy to ripple and leap like a stream throughout this letter. Now, we need to remember the circumstances from which and about which Paul is writing. He's not writing from some secluded, restful retreat center located on a sandy beach in the beautiful Greek Isles. He is in chains. He is in prison. He is in Rome. And he's waiting to make his defense, before, defense of the gospel before Nero. Nero is one of the most corrupt ruthless, ungodly of all the Caesars. While he's in prison, he hears of trouble brewing in the church in Philippi. Some of the leaders are in conflict, stubbornly insisting on their own way on the issues before the congregation. This looking out for their own interests, as Paul calls it later in the letter, is tearing apart the unity of the church. Further, there are some agitators who have come into the church and they are suggesting to people that they need more than Christ and his cross. They need to also be circumcised in order to be saved. 
and persecution is rising. What Paul sees happening under Nero in Rome is beginning to brew in Philippi. Yet, Paul tells his friends that he's praying for them with joy. Joy? In those circumstances, why? Because of this gospel indicative, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul is not ignoring the difficult realities he and they are facing. He's not being a Pollyanna. He's simply taking his stand on the gospel. God has started a good work, and God always finishes what he starts. Indeed, God only starts what he intends to finish. God had begun a good work in Paul years earlier as Paul traveled the road from um, Jerusalem to Damascus. He was on his way to take believers of Jesus captive, to bring them back to Jerusalem to be beaten and jailed. On his way, the living Jesus appears to Paul, then Saul, in a blazing light and began a new work in Paul's life. Being in prison would not thwart that work. God had begun a new work in the church at Philippi, and none of the news Paul heard would thwart that work. Conflict within, pressures from without. None of it would stop God from completing the work he began. Let it burn our ways, its way into our souls and hearts and minds, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, I think you can see that there are a number of corollaries of this great indicative of the gospel. It is God, not we, who began the good work, it is God, not we, who keeps the work going. And it is God, not we, who will see it through to the end. So, we ask, what is this good work? Everything announced in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our salvation in all of its dimensions. The world's salvation in all of its dimensions. Creation salvation in all of its dimensions. This good work is in the words Paul uses in many of his letters, our justification, our sanctification, our glorification. This good work is being forgiven and acquitted of all charges against us. This good work is being set free from the powers of sin and evil and death and being brought into the kingdom and family of God. This good work is being changed and transformed into the likeness of Jesus. This good work is being brought into friendship with the Trinity, into the inner life of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what Paul rejoices in is that this good work is God's work from the beginning, in the middle, and to the end. None of us began the good work of our salvation. None of us. You realize that, do you not? We like to think that somehow we had a hand in beginning the new life in Christ. We'd like to think that after careful reasoning and weighing all the facts and alternatives, we decided that the wisest thing to do would be to throw our lot in with Jesus Christ, receive him as Savior, and surrender to him as Lord. Right? We therefore can suddenly pack ourselves on the back. We were wise to seek after God and find him in Jesus. But that is not what happened. No human being on our own seeks after God. We seek, but none of us intentionally on our own seek after God. Paul was not on that road seeking God in Jesus. Paul was on that road to get rid of the name of Jesus. So Paul, in his letter to the Romans, quotes the psalmist. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Apart from the saving grace of God, our natural posture toward God is that of rejecting God 
and its claims on our life. Apart from grace, we run from the one true living God. Some overtly so, most subtly so in sophisticated ways. In running from the one true living God, we create gods in our own image. We create gods with whom we can feel comfortable. We, feel, we create gods who affirm our ways and our thoughts. We create gods who dance to our tunes. We create gods who put no demands on us. No one, apart from grace, runs toward the living God. Which means we all stand in need of a miracle. A miracle, every one of us. The miracle of God himself breaking through the barriers, breaking into the hidden places, breaking through the doubts and fears, and winning us to himself. The conversion of C.S. Lewis in the last century wonderfully illustrates this. C.S. Lewis is this brilliant uh, thinker and writer from, from England. He's the author of the Narnia series, Screw Tape Letters and Mere Christianity. And for years, he claimed he was a thoroughgoing agnostic, yet he came to faith. How? In his autobiography entitled Surprised by Joy, he describes God work, God's work in him. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing, the divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet, but who can duly adore the love that will open the high gates to the prodigal who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful, darting his eyes in every direction for a chance to escape. It is God, not we, who begins this good work in us. As Paul prays, as Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, for by grace you were saved through faith, and that faith is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God not as a result of works that no one should boast. Rejoice, yes, boast, no. None of us began this good work. As Jesus told the first disciples gathered in the upper room before he went to the cross, you did not choose me. I chose you. And God keeps this good work moving forward. None of us does, for none of us can. We're talking about a new life we ourselves did not create and cannot sustain. Only Christ himself can create life in Christ. And only Christ himself can keep this life in Christ going. Yes, we do have a part to play. As Paul will say in another exhortation in his letter, chapter 2, verse 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That sentence may have caused many of you fear and trembling. It's very strong language. No messing around. Throw your whole self into it with fear and trembling, with deep reverence and a sense of awe. Work it out. Your salvation, work it out. But then right on the heels of that exhortation is another gospel indicative, another guarantee to citizens. 3, 2, 13. 4. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. We can work out our salvation because God is working in our salvation. We can work out our salvation only because God is working in our salvation. As many have expressed it, we are simply working out what God is working in. God starts the work. God keeps the good work going. And God will bring the good work to its completion. How do we know that? Because God only begins what he intends to complete. He only starts what he plans to finish. God has begun a good work in each of us here today. You would not be here unless he had begun that good work. Even if you are reluctantly here. God has begun a good work in each of us, and God intends to finish what he started. It is that guarantee 
the guarantee of our heavenly citizenship that enabled Paul to pray the way he did for his friends in Philippi. And it's why he goes on to pray what he does. I think that verses 9 through 11, in verses 9 to 11, Paul is now giving us a picture of what this good work really looks like. That makes sense, does it not? He's praying for his friends in Christ, for his fellow citizens. And then he, express, he expresses the gospel indicative. He who began a good work in you will complete it on the day of Christ. And then he prays. And what he prays is this good work in Christ. So, Philippians 1.9. This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. God is at work making us into lovers. And a special breed of lovers. People who love as God loves, extravagantly and incalculably, incalculatingly. God is working to cause our love to abound. The actual word that's translated abound, Paul seems to have made up. We don't find it anywhere else in the New Testament. And it means to overflow, to be extremely rich, to have more than enough. One New Testament scholar puts it this way. Perhaps no other word so characterized for Paul, the new age opened by Christ, than this word. It's a new age of extravagance. As we hear Jesus open up for us in his, his parables. This new age in Christ is no meager age. Paul's word leads to the image of running over wave upon wave. God's love running over wave upon wave. And Paul prays that we citizens might be so caught up in that love that we love in the same way. Talk about a good work. He prays that we be so abounding and abounding love that we have no room to store it. Immeasurably more. Love that is immeasurably more and more and more. Now, this explains why Paul then can pray the way he does about his love for the Philippians. 1.8, I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, some of you may have grown up using the King James Version of the Bible, and you might remember the translation this way. I long for you all with the bowels of Christ Jesus. <laughs> A bit indelicate, indelicate, but it is the literal meaning of the word Paul uses. The word is splankna. It means guts. It refers to the place where we feel our deepest emotions, a place deeper than the heart, a place deeper than the liver, a place in the, the deepest place in the human person, the guts. I long for you all with the guts of Jesus Christ. Matthew tells us that Jesus saw a large crowd, downcast, downcast lost uh, like sheep without a shepherd, and he felt compassion for them, splankna. He was moved in his guts. Matthew tells us on another occasion, another large crowd gathered around Jesus. They had traveled a long distance to find him and listen to his teaching, and they were hungry. And Jesus sees the crowd, and Matthew says, he felt compassion for them. Splankna. He was moved in his guts. On another occasion, two blind men recognize Jesus, and they cry out, Son of David, have mercy on us. And then Matthew says, Jesus was moved to compassion, splankna, guts. Jesus was moved to the deepest recesses of his being. In the Christmas story, as told by Luke in his gospel, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, sings a song known as the Benedictus, Blessed be the God of Israel. And he sings about the events of Christmas, referring to them as God visiting the earth, as God visiting humanity. And then he sings of the driving force of this visiting because of the tender mercy of God. Splankna is the word. God comes to us in Jesus because God is moved in his guts, because human need pulls at his bowels. I long for you all with the splunkna of Jesus Christ. Paul tells the Philippians, I long for you the way Jesus Christ longs for you. I long for you with the gut-wrenching love of Messiah himself. But of course, Paul is in Christ. And being in Christ means being all that is in Christ. 
When we are alive in Christ, we begin to live what Christ lives, especially his love. Paul loves the Philippians with Christ's love because Paul is living in Christ's love for the Philippians. And he prays that the Philippians and we may abound in that love still more and more. That is the good work God has begun in the citizens of the gospel. A love with real knowledge and discernment, says Paul. A love that thinks as deeply as it feels. A love that is wise as it is extravagant. Oh, dear God, work such love in me. God begins only what he contends to finish. Paul goes on to pray. Verse 10, so that you may approve the things that are excellent. God is at work in us, making us into people who choose well who can cut through all the glitter and hype, who can rise above trivial pursuits of those who do not know God, and then who can give themselves to things that really matter, that are excellent and eternal, who do not settle for the merely good, but who seek the best that God has for his people. God only begins what he intends to perfect. Paul Praise more of this good work. Verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness simply means right relatedness. God is at work in righting relationships. You can count on this in any circumstance. God is at work righting strained and broken relationships. We might not be at work in that way, but we might be afraid or resistant or angry or weary, but not God. God is going for it. God is writing all relationships. God is writing the relationship with himself. God is writing the relationship with others. God is writing the relationship with the self. God is writing the relationship with creation. And in the process, he's making us a people who have passion for right relationship. A people with passion for justice and peace. God only begins what he intends to perfect. 111, Paul continues, to the glory and praise of God. God is making people who live for the glory of God. God is making a people who seek to glorify God in all that they do, who are then filled with that glory and who radiate that glory wherever they go in the world. Oh, Lord, please. God only begins what he intends to perfect. And praying out the good word Paul prays, now back to verse 10, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Sincere. The word Paul uses means sun-tested. The Latin for this word is sine sera, and it means without wax. Sine, without, sera, wax. Sine, sera, without wax. Now, the biggest industry in first century Rome was pottery making. Cheap pottery was very thick. Expensive pottery was very thin and delicate. And often the thin pottery would crack in being fired in the oven. Dishonest pottery dealers would then fill the cracks with wax. And then they would paint over the cracks with the wax in it and sell the vases as the genuine article. But when the buyer took the vase home, and either left it in the heat of the sun or poured hot fluid into it, the wax would melt. Honest pottery dealers mark their vases and jars sine sera. No wax in the cracks. God is working in us, making us into the real deal. God is at work making us into the genuine article. No wax, no faking, no pretense, no hiding. God is working in us to be able to take the heat. God is working to make us authentic humans. And he only begins what he intends to perfect. Until the day of Christ, says Paul, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, the apostle Paul was such a Christ-captured man such a Christ-focused man, such a Christ-centered man that he longed for this day of Christ. Not only because suffering would be alleviated, not only because he could now see long-lost loved ones, he longs for that day because then he is going to see Christ face to face. 
He longs for that day because on that day, Christ will finally be given first place in everything. On that day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so Paul's whole pastoral ministry in Christ is oriented toward that day. A number of years ago, a New Testament scholar named James Thompson wrote a book entitled Pastoral Ministry According to Paul, A Biblical Vision. And in the book, Thompson argues that Paul's ministry with all the churches is driven to prepare people for that great day. As he puts it, ministry for Paul, and therefore ministry for those trained by Paul, is participating in God's work Participating in God's work of transforming the community of faith until it is blameless at the coming of Christ. So Paul lives for that great day and so lives for that great day that he serves in a way that prepares individuals and communities to be ready when Christ appears. And here's what I want to stress today. Paul is not worried that we will not be prepared. Let me say that again. Paul is not worried that we will not be prepared. As he longs for that day, he is not afraid. He's not afraid of not being prepared. He's not afraid for himself nor for the Philippians. Paul is in jail. His friends in Philippi are facing all kinds of challenges, but he is not afraid of being ready for the great day. Why? Because of that great day guarantee stamped on our passports being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus the one who is coming is the one who is working in us to be ready that's the wonder of being citizens of the heavenly empire Nearly 300 years ago, in 1738, God began a good work in a man named Charles Wesley, who spoke of that moment when he felt his heart strangely warmed. He then went on to write 6,000 hymns. Talk about abounding. A decade after this work began, in 1747, he wrote a hymn that provides me a way to pray in response to this text in Philippians. It begins, Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. And then it concludes, Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory, Till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. The God who comes to us in Jesus Christ, as Jesus Christ, always finishes what he starts. <laughs> 